Good evening, everybody. My name is John Monahan, and I am the warden of Hart House at the University of Toronto. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to tonight's Hart House conversation, part of our Changemaker series. Tonight's topic is disability inclusion and accessibility in a post COVID world. What lies ahead? Featuring our special guest, Lauren McDonald. For more than a century, Hart House has been a student focused center that enriches students learning outside the classroom through engagement with the arts, wellness, and dialogue. And it is the third of these pillars, dialogue, that brings us here tonight for the third event in our Changemakers series this year. And while we are coming to you virtually tonight, I want you to know that our spaces are open again for most activities, and we look forward to welcoming you back into our building on the St. George campus of the University of Toronto at future events. Changemakers is a series of fireside style chats with inspiring folks whose discontent with the status quo propels them to be the change that they want to see in the world. We call them Changemakers. And these are folks who devote their lives to affecting meaningful and sustainable change in the interests of justice and equity. Simply put, they are people who see a need for change and respond to it. They are leaders by example. Now, before we dive into tonight's discussion with Lauren McDonald, I want to take a brief moment to pause and encourage you to pause with me as we reflect on the land where we are this evening. For those of you who are joining from the University of Toronto downtown campus or downtown to Toronto generally, we are on Treaty 13 territory. This land for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat and the Seneca, and it is both the traditional and the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory where I am located this evening is also the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee to mutually share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Today, Toronto continues to be the meeting place and the home to many Indigenous people from all across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to build community and connect live and work on this land. If you're joining us from other locations, I encourage you to consider the histories and the experiences of the Indigenous communities in your locations, those who've come before and who continue to steward and to share their lands with us. Now, you've seen a message already on your screen about questions and answers. So before we get into tonight's conversation, I just wanna take a moment to highlight how important audience ideas and questions are to us. We want you to feel part of this conversation. And so we will save time at the end of, our, of my conversation with Lauren this evening uh, for your questions. And that's why I would encourage you to post anything that you want to ask using the Q&A function in Zoom. We will get to as many of the questions as we can, though not all of them. So uh, with that said, I am delighted, beyond delighted, uh, to again welcome you to tonight's presentation on disability inclusion and accessibility in a post-COVID world, what lies ahead. And I can think of no one better to engage this topic than our special guest, Lauren McDonald. Lauren is a human rights lawyer and one of Canada's most respected voices and committed advocates when it comes to accessibility and disability issues and disability justice more generally. Lauren has presented over the years to thousands of people, both inside and outside of the disability and the legal communities. And she is known as someone who can and does influence minds. She moves hearts. She propels people to positive action. And Lauren always uses her superpowers for good. Her passion for and her commitment to accessibility and inclusion are informed by her own lived experience as a woman born with profound hearing loss. 
Lauren has been honored for her contributions uh, by her alma mater, Western University in London, by the City of London, by numerous nonprofit and community organizations, by the province of Ontario, by the legal profession, and many other organizations. Last year, in 2021, Lauren received two prestigious national honors. First, Canadian Lawyer Magazine named her one of its top 25 most influential lawyers in the human rights category. And she was also included in Canada's list of most powerful women, the top 100 list by the Women's Executive Network. And that same network also honored Lauren with its prestigious Inclusion Vanguard Award. So with no further delay, please join me in welcoming Lauren McDonald, tonight's change maker. Hi, Lauren. Hey, how are you, John? I'm so happy to see you. I'm well, thank you. And I'm looking forward to this conversation uh, with you tonight. It's going to be great, I think. Thank you so much for inviting me. And before we start, I too belong to the same uh, Treaty 13 being in downtown Toronto. So thank you so much for acknowledging how important um, those statements are before we get into dive into anything. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren, I want to start, if you're uh, amenable, with a little bit of your personal journey. Um, so let me start by asking you, do you mind being called a change maker? Um, uh, I guess it's better than being called a shit disturber. <laughs> but, why, but Lauren, why choose? <laughs> but uh, but no, it, it's um, sorry for the language, folks. I'll, I'll clean it up from now on. But uh, but no, it, it's uh, it's a flattering. Um, name to be given um but i never take it seriously because there's so much work to be done but i do acknowledge that i have been um, able to make some changes happen uh, some large some small and so i guess i come back by that uh, honestly so thank you i think you do i think you do lauren can you tell us a bit more about your personal journey and how it led you to devote your life to this work. Where does your motivation come from? You spend so much time and energy fighting for the rights of people that have relationship to disability. What motivates you to do that? Well, from the start, um, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was a very, very active community volunteer. My grandfather was a community builder. And so it was, very much ingrained that volunteerism and giving back to the community is just what you do. It's the, uh, the rent you pay for your uh, room here on earth, which is attributed to uh, Muhammad Ali, but many others have, have laid claim to that as well. And so I will say without hesitation that being a volunteer from my teen straight through has allowed me to build the skills um, in terms of learning about board governance, consensus building, empathy, decision making, and uh, build your confidence as well, because you may not have those opportunities in your paid work as you're starting out. And then that volunteerism, it changed over the years that I was able to see that from when, I'm, when I was in my 20s, I was, it was more about learning. Mm -hmm. and learning how things work, learning how teams work, learning how to accomplish a, a certain goal that's before you. But then as I moved into my 30s, I became much more focused on what can I do as someone living with a disability to make Ontario more accessible. And so I was involved with the Ontarian with Disabilities Act a committee with David Lepofsky, who was the head of that. And, uh, and so I was more focused on learning what could I do uh, in that regard. And then of course, when I finished law school and entered the profession, 
my focus in volunteer work shifted again so that I was doing more work within the legal profession with the Ontario Bar Association, the Law Society, uh, the Arch Disability Law Center. And that, so that's how I could see the progression, but all of those volunteer experiences definitely, uh, definitely informed me as I was going through my professional path, which again, was transformed because initially I was working in advertising and public relations, which were very communication driven profession, yeah. yet I was living with a communication disability. And so I, I had to learn through trial and error that this might not be the right profession for me, especially in public relations, where it's all about schmoozing at the cocktail parties, and it can be a little difficult to, uh, to hear what's going on. And so I progressed from that into doing special events. I'm, I'm a very good organizer, so I love doing that. Then I moved into government working with uh, Mayor Art Eggleton uh, back in the day at the City of Toronto. And, uh, and it was great, uh, a great opportunity. I still keep in touch with uh, Art to this day and moved into nonprofit. So I was back then in the 80s and the, um, the 90s, it was quite acceptable to kind of move around until you found your place. Um, almost much like what it is now in our very contract driven temporary um, employment field that we have. And so it was when I had a car accident that was actually 25 years ago last month. Um, I was running my own business, a small office services company, because my previous job as the executive director of the Barrier Free Design Center in uh, College Park uh, back then was an architectural firm that sought to make environments, both physical as well as attitudinal environments accessible for people with disabilities. But this was 1994. And so at that point, people weren't ready to have that conversation. So when the government cut the funding, I went back to my hometown and set up my own business. Just as a temporary stock gap, uh, it was uh, just an office services company, small. And then I had the car accident that made it very difficult for me to walk. And I had chronic headaches and, and migraines. So my lawyer at the time for the personal injury uh, suit said to me, you know, have you ever thought about what you're gonna do now? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I don't think this is going to work for me. And he said, well, have you ever thought about going to law school? And so at the time I thought, well, yeah, I, I like legal shows and books and stuff like that. Sure, it'd be good. And then I thought, well, sure. How hard can that be? And I only applied to one law school and I got in. But the thing is, is that I was able to take all of that volunteer experience I had in disability and later and, and realized that I was seeing how things were about paperwork and politics. And I thought if I knew the law and understood it, I could really be a force for change um, by understanding the process. And so that's when that morphed into me having my own practice. So, so sorry for the long answer. No, it's a great answer. So both of us went to law school in our 30s. We were not... um, you're very kind, but I was 41. I don't know about you. Yeah, that's a that's a rounding error. But details. <laughs> small details. I was never good with math. Uh, but um, one of the thing, one of the reasons I went was I remember. Uh, someone told me that Madam Justice Bertha Wilson, yeah. uh, the, the great Supreme Court Justice, uh, she had gone to law school in her 30s. And her reason for doing that was uh, she thought that law, the study of law was the perfect way to finish one's education. And uh, so I kind of went to law school. I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I just wanted to become one. Uh, what about you? Did you, 
did you want to be a lawyer in order to be able to make some of the systemic changes that you have been so fighting so hard to make? Well, of course, I think that I was really hoping to create change. And I envision, you know, being the first lawyer with profound hearing loss to appear before um, the Supreme Court of Canada. And, uh, but more importantly, I really wanted to a, get a strong liberal arts education. And once I say that once you enter law school, you're ruined because you have an understanding of the law and you see it everywhere. In every story that you read in the paper, that you hear on the news, you see the legal implications because of course it was Shakespeare who wrote, the first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. Why is that? And I can't say it. I think it was Henry, one of the Henrys um, <laughs> in, in the play. But why is that? It's because lawyers represent law and order. And, and the first thing, if you are corrupt, like certain people are going on right now, the first thing you do is you want to get rid of the lawyers because you don't want any barriers in your way. So I'm very grateful for my legal education. I highly recommend it to uh, the students who are looking for a post-undergrad degree because it really does uh, change your worldview for the better, in my opinion. Lots of recovering lawyers out there, but our education stays with us. Lauren, you're also a social entrepreneur. You created an organization called HearView uh, a few years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and uh, for those who want to check it out, um, it, I think the website may be put in the chat. And uh, but what that was is that was born out of my personal frustration of wanting to attend live events. And of course, I needed accommodation for it. I needed to be able to hear what was going on. But the only way I can hear is by viewing through captioning. And so I was very, very frustrated in constantly um, requesting communication inclusion and being told the same thing. No one has asked for it. We have sign language interpreters. Good for you. Doesn't help me. Um, you know, it's too expensive. Uh, we don't know how it works. We don't have the staff to do this. Uh, there's not enough time. So John, the tipping point really came in June of 2018 when Luminato was in Toronto. And there was an international human rights lawyer named Amal Cloney who was uh, presenting. And uh, I really wanted to hear what she had to say. Um, because it's important, the work she does. So I requested captioning to make it inclusive. Tickets were $300 a piece and, uh, for the seat near the front. And we're told that no, there wouldn't be captioning, but you can buy a ticket near the front. And I'm like, A, it's $300. And B, I'm not going to get everything that is said. And for that kind of money for a ticket, I want to have full accessibility. So at that point, I thought, you know what, something's got to be done, <laughs> got to be done. And I think that's when a lot of innovation happens, when these things happen over and over, and someone says there, there ought to be a law or, you know, there's a better way to do this. So who better than I to try and do this? But I didn't know how. So this happened in June of 2018. I, I suffered some personal losses. Um, father was, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mother um, seriously ill with Parkinson. She was to pass a few months later. Um, fast forward to June of 2019, so a year after this event. And I'm reading Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, like who hasn't read Michelle Obama's book? And Michelle Obama was a corporate lawyer, but partway through the book, she talked about how that didn't really satisfy her anymore. It wasn't what her soul needed and decided she really wanted to be doing healthcare um, work, community work and transition. 
to doing that. And for me, that was a big aha moment to give myself permission that it's okay to shift gears and not practice law formally, but do something different. And at that moment, I closed the book, no word of a lie. I closed the book, decided I need to get moving on this idea that I had in my head. And when I create the idea of having captioning available at large live events on the large screen, Michelle Obama is going to be my first live event. Had no idea how, none. She had just finished her book tour in Canada and I uh, know no idea. And I got very busy. I sponsored events, primarily women, primarily charities. I sponsored those events personally to remove the notes. So the no one could say, no, we don't have the money. There's no staff. We don't know how this works. I said, I will come in and do it all for you. And uh, actually, John, today, March 9th, two years ago, was here viewed final event, live event wow. before COVID. And uh, that was the CEO Global Summit with Prime Minister Trudeau um, right. uh, present. And great positive feedback. And the biggest shift after COVID and even before was talking about captioning is not just for those people who live with hearing loss. It supports English as a second language, people with learning disabilities, um, people who may not hear in a venue with poor acoustics. It, it supports everyone. Maybe there's a presenter on the stage that you're not hearing well or understanding. And so in five very short months, there was tremendous, tremendous change. But then COVID happened and here we are. So now here view is just a resource. But I think it sounds like a very important chapter in, in your life. And it also sounds like a chapter that is that, like much of your life, is helping other people and paying dividends to them. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you mentioned uh, the pandemic and captioning. I'm wondering, is that one of the, um, is, it a, is, a, is it a silver lining of sorts in the pandemic? The fact that uh, these sorts of virtual conversations have become more commonplace and, uh, and uh, captioning has been more widely available. Has that been helpful during this otherwise horrible two years? And it's interesting you say that because when I set up here, view, I was also very frustrated by auto-generated captioning. Or for example, if you go to YouTube, you look at a video and you click on that little CC button and you see what happens. And now I call that output at the time, captioning, because what you see is crap. It is not the same as a, a, a court reporter who is trained to provide com, uh, computer assisted real time um, transcription. And so I knew in the summer of 2019 that I had about a five year window before auto generated captioning, artificial intelligence would improve because at the time it was at 70% accuracy versus 99.9 .9 or 5% accuracy of a human, you know, captioner. So I knew I had that time. But when COVID happened, that five-year window compressed to about 12 to 18 months. And so that was very, um, it's a good thing that came out of COVID. Uh, it's still not perfect by any means. But, and I'm, I then tried to educate Zoom and said, you cannot charge for this because it was only available for paid subscriptions. You need to remove this. Accessibility should not come at a cost. You are not charging for someone to use a ramp or someone to use an automatic door opener. Stop it. <laughs> and surprisingly, they listen. And other platforms have varying degrees of success with respect to the captioning. So that is something that came out of COVID. And it was just the focus on research and development for technology has been a boon that has come out of COVID. Lauren, let's talk about 
accessibility more broadly then, okay? So in Ontario, uh, the signature piece of legislation that supports access, of course, is the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act or the AODA, you already referenced it. And back when it was launched, it came with the promise that that legislation would transform Ontario through a, through a focus on strong enforcement and mechanisms for enforcement. Now, we are just a few years away from the 20th anniversary of the legislation uh, and the timeline by which the AODA was supposed to be fully enacted. But uh, recently, uh, the former Lieutenant Governor, David Onley, he uh, submitted an independent review of the implementation of the AODA and the adjective that he used to describe the progress was glacial. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with his assessment? Yes, absolutely. And first, I want to say that embedded in the legislation are independent reviews that take place every five years. So a shout out to University of Toronto because Mayo Moran, who was the former dean of your law school, uh, did the second uh, independent review. Uh, there now have been three independent reviews pretty much saying the same thing. It's get it together, Ontario, and let's move on this. And so when you consider from the first independent review 15 years ago, there's been, the population has grown and more and more people are acquiring uh, disabilities. And right now we've got 2.9 million Ontarians living with disabilities. So back in 2005, when the law was enacted, 2025 seemed like far away, but it seemed, it felt like an achievable goal that we can do this, but it's now three years out and we are not going to be a barrier-free province. And unfortunately, there is now a fourth independent review underway. And I expect that will be a very interesting report to read. So how far behind our, our, our goals are we? How, how, how bad is it? <laughs> well, and, and I always try to focus on, on the positive first before I get into my uh, slamming uh, mode. And, you want both. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? There has been progress made, absolutely. 17 years ago, the AODA was uh, enacted. And since then, we have various regulations in place. I started working on the customer service regulation, which all of the U of T employees need to do that customer service training um, to uh, as part of your work. And then we also have regulations in information and communication, employment, transportation, public spaces. And um, most recently, there has been work done because everything wasn't covered. And we heard very clearly that there needed to be a regulation for education as well as for healthcare. So I was privileged to be appointed to work on the healthcare uh, standard or standard before it becomes regulation. We just completed our work last month. It is now with the minister's office, uh, the minister for seniors and accessibility for his review. And then pending his review, any additions or what have you, it will start wending its way to becoming a regulation. So those are really good things. There's been a lot of conversation. The AODA also paved the way for accessibility legislation in other provinces, such as, you know, the in Manitoba, that was in 2013. Then we have Nova Scotia in 2017. We've got federal legislation now, the Accessible Canada Act, and that was uh, passed in 2019. And we have the Accessible British Columbia uh, Act that is proposed last year that is working through. And so those are the positives. But what are the things that need to still be done? The problem is that there's a lot of education, John, happening about what are your rights? 
as a person with a disability. But the problem is the infrastructure is not there to support people with disability when their rights are infringed. And so they now know this is not right. You can't do this and file a complaint with the Human Rights Tribunal. But then the tribunal is not prepared or not equipped, funded, what have you, to handle the influx of uh, complaints. So that is a very, very difficult thing. And accessibility cannot be the responsibility of one ministry. You know, the government as a whole tone from the top need to implement this. And there needs to be um, a complaint system for reporting AODA violations, um, because that would really help. Because people right now, their only recourse is really filing a human rights complaint, which is not good. And there's infrastructure that needs to happen, because when you consider making transit, accessible. That's multi-million of dollars to do that. So there needs to be a reform of how infrastructure either like um, retroactively or new infrastructure is built in with that disability lens to make sure that there's no new barrier being right. enacted. So those are just a few of my thoughts. It's a huge topic, John. We could talk no, about I you know? I, no, I know, I know. And, uh, you know, as you're talking, I'm remembering that the, the, um, the AODA showed such promise, I thought, because the penalties for non-compliance were so significant. It wasn't it like $100,000 for every violation, like that could accumulate very quickly into the millions of dollars. Of course. And to the best of my knowledge, there has been none, or like zero or next to zero enforcement. Yeah. And I think because the, the province has adopted a carrot rather than a stick yeah. approach. And you have to consider as well, in a province like Ontario, small business makes up a huge portion of that. It's yeah. the mom and pop stores on the corner and those small uh, employers. And it, it's hard to keep on top of, of all of those businesses throughout Ontario. So the, the province has adopted more of an education approach. And um, if there's a violation, give you opportunity to correct it. But of course, there's some violators who, who are quite egregious in what they've done, but they're still, to my knowledge as well, been no large uh, penalty, monetary penalty thus far. And so that's why we're frustrated because the AODA came into place because we were uh, upset about the previous Ontarians with Disabilities Act locking teeth in terms of an enforcement mechanism. But here we are almost 20 years later and, and I'm not blaming the current provincial government this was under the previous government as well. And um, so there needs to be a political will to advance it, disrespective of whatever government is in power. Where do you think that political will will come from? Uh, honestly, I think from personal experience. You know, once the powers that be are personally impacted by disability, either themselves or a loved one, they will have that, they will step out of their privilege of being able-bodied and their eyes will be open. And I remember the former minister of, um, that had the disability file, Marie Boutriani, mm -hmm. who is a, a dear friend. And she said at, at one time, and she said it more than once, that she would be talking with business people and the, a businessman would say to her, you know, as a business person, I'm not happy with the AODA. And it seems to be um, too, uh, too many rules and regulations and all of this. But as a father of a child with a disability, you're not moving fast enough. Wow. 
Wow. So that's a pretty powerful statement. And it showed you how that personal connection, um, it matters. And I think that's true across everything. Yeah. You know, you don't truly understand until you until it happens to you walk that mile in someone's yes. shoes. Yes. So the first question from our uh, our audience participants tonight uh, is, uh, I think, a really interesting one. Are there any jurisdictions uh, where accessibility work is being done exceptionally well? Any uh, any examples? that Ontario or Canada should be following? Well, and it just, the AODA was built on looking at those other jurisdictions, such as other Commonwealth countries, our, our neighbors to the South. And I have not personally experienced this um, because I'm, I haven't been traveling, but then again, who has in the last two years? But I understand that in England, in the UK, there is quite, a level of accessibility in that the, the taxi cabs that you get in have captioning available when you get into them. And, uh, and, and of course the ADA, it's unfair to compare the AODA in Ontario to the Americans with Disabilities Act. One, because they've been in place, it has been in place for 32 years. We're, we're not, we're only at 17 years. And two, they have the critical mass of people, whereas in Ontario, our generation is spread out so much that in the US, there's the critical mass to create the demand for accessibility services. Um, but you know what, all of the jurisdiction, they do some things very well, they do some things not so well. And so it's very difficult because what the UK does they have a different environment, politically, geographically, uh, in terms of demographics, what have you, than we have here in Canada. So the AODA was the first legislation that made it mandatory for compliance. This was something that was not available in any other jurisdiction. So it, it, my long answer to that question is that there are some jurisdictions that do things well, but it's very difficult to compare because we're not the same, mm. you know, mm. but we can learn from each other and uh, adopt approaches as they happen, but right. we're a province, we're not a country. Right. And so when you're talking about the UK, the, the United States, Australia versus Ontario, we can't compare. Um, speaking of the United States, Lauren, um, there was a recent survey done of employees in the United States yeah. that found that something like three quarters or more than three quarters of employees with disabilities mm -hmm. felt that their employers were doing a better job of providing them with necessary supports during the pandemic than they were before the pandemic. Now, hopefully the pandemic is coming to an end soon, but, but we have seen the rise of remote work and different considerations around how to engage and support employees. Yeah. What kinds of opportunities do you see for practicing inclusion better as we consider how to change the workplace or what to keep in the post-pandemic environment? Yeah, um, that is an interesting question. I'm always um, acutely aware of citing US uh, data, mm. and but that's something that's very much missing in Canada that we don't have a lot of current data to inform our decision making. So 77% of employees in the US, is that what we're experiencing here in Canada? But the flavor of it is that a lot of employees in the US feel their employer has been doing well by them. But or better, or better. Or better than they were pre-COVID. And, but I wanna talk first, John, about consider pre-COVID that a lot of employees with disabilities really wanted, some needed, 
to have the option, the flexibility of working from home and have been told for years and years, no, it couldn't happen. No, we're not adopting this policy. No, it's gonna to be too difficult. We need you in the office. Um, just try to get on time uh, for your job when you're relying on accessible transit, which is very infrequently on, or infrequently on time. So consider John, the minute that COVID hit, how quickly did employers turn things on a dime to create a workplace that worked from home very, very quickly. And why was that? And in my view, that was a stunning example of ableism, which is prejudice in favor or um, leaning more towards supporting people living without disability. And so ableism is not a word that was really known that much um, before COVID, but that to me was the best example of how on a dime things change. Yes, so uh, when, when, um, when it has to, government can change quickly, can change direction, can respond. Uh, and it goes back to that that political will that you were talking about earlier, when suddenly something is affecting the entire population, anything is possible. But when it is, yeah, yeah, a smaller group, then it, then it's it's much harder. Another really interesting question in the uh, in the Q and A's: Do you, as someone who is known as a as an advocate for accessibility specifically? Do you ever feel that accessibility gets lost or overlooked in the broader movement towards equity, diversity, and inclusion? Because there are so many other worthwhile and pressing struggles for racial justice, for uh, the rights of the trans community, uh, so many struggles happening at once. Do you ever feel that the conversation about accessibility becomes overwhelmed in that larger conversation? Yes, every single day, John. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a struggle that was very real pre-COVID yeah. where it seemed that we were fighting, we meaning the disability community was fighting for airtime to talk about um, the needs of the disability community. But once COVID hit, it shines a glaring spotlight on inequities pre-COVID that became worse. And we saw that again from our neighbor to the South. I think the George Floyd murder really broke open that conversation about anti-racism. Here in Canada, the discovery of the grave, the residential school grave, broke open a conversation about Indigenous rights. These are not new issues. You know, the Black community has been struggling for 400 years, you know, and the residential school problem has been apparent and known for quite a while through the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Report. This is nothing new. And the, the struggles of uh, immigrants and uh, racialized people and uh, those conversations started happening under the umbrella term of BIPOC, which I do not like. You cannot possibly lump Black, Indigenous, persons of color all into one group, you're BIPOC. Well, if you are, where are the people with disabilities? We're off to the side. But the reality is disability covers all of BIPOC because it also brings to mind the issue of intersectionality. You're not just one person. You're not just a black person, you know, a person of color and whatever. You have intersection, intersecting identities that need to be respected as well. And so I'm very frustrated. Now, again, I talked about the United States, how they have that critical mouth Plus, they've had the Americans with Disabilities Act for 32 years. So here we call it 
DEI with diversity, equity, and inclusion. But in the state, they call it IDEA, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. We need to get our A, <laughs> we need to get our act together to get that A included because it, it's not. And it's been very frustrating because throughout COVID, people with disabilities were once again left to the side in the conversations about planning for um, everything from vaccine protocol to emergency funding support. And um, it just, it's tiresome. It's very tiresome. So that leads me to another great question from our from our uh, audience this evening. And, and this, I wanna thank everyone that has put a, a question uh, in the q and I'm afraid we won't have time for all of them. Uh, but uh, thank you for being so engaged. There is a, a question that I think is really important, and that is whether, uh, let me start again. Do What do you see as the role of persons with disabilities in educating other people about disability rights and legal entitlements to accommodation? At what point is it too much to expect a person with a disability to also be the subject matter expert when it comes to questions about legal rights, accommodations. Another way of, I think, asking this question is, uh, is it fair to ask you mm -hmm. and other people with disability to do all of the work to advocate for change? You said that the work can be tiring. Uh, yeah. I, I bet it's exhausting at times. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, what should the, those people that do not have personal relationship to disability, what should our role be in the fights that you are fighting? How can we work beside you? Well, and it's just like, John, I'm a human rights lawyer. So I chose this path, but not all, not all people with disability do choose that path or some may not even be able to choose that path depending on the severity of their disability. Every day I wake up and wonder what hill am I going to die on today? What matter is going to be so important that I simply have to address it? That's a choice I make because I've always centered my um, human rights and accessibility work on how can I amplify or use my voice for people whose voices are muted or unable to use their voice at all. And how can I advance that somehow? But it's the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, for example, there was a live event or um, I'm sorry, a, a virtual event. I requested captioning. Organizer came back oh, we're so delighted to say we have sign language interpreters for this event. Okay, Hill, am I dying? Yes, I am. Okay, I had to educate about that's great, but that's not going to be beneficial to me personally because I need captioning. This is why these are the uh, people that will benefit from having captioning and form about communication inclusion, but that's my choice. And it's the same, John, in my view, is if you are working in an office, in a workplace, you have an Indigenous employee, you go to them and say, would you mind writing us a land acknowledgement? Right. You know, or a Black employee, we need an anti-racism policy. Can you do it up for us? It's not the, the responsibility of marginalized people to fix your problem, you know? It needs to be part of a broader conversation. And so the most important thing that I say to people when they think of the terms that have come up since COVID that we didn't know before, the terms like privilege, you know, terms like allyship and ableism, and those, things, those terms were not known really or discussed much before COVID. So the first thing I say is you can't be an ally without understanding the history. 
you need to really do a deep dive and understanding disability history about eugenics, about institutionalization, uh, enforced uh, sterilization, uh, residential schools, which we're hearing because they were in the disability community as well as the indigenous community and the social realities of today. You can't just hold your hand up and say, oh, I'm an ally for people with disability. Really, what do you know about us? And then you have to, you have to learn, you have to listen, and then you have to act for by amplifying voices, by being a sponsor, by looking around you and seeing who is present at the table, who is not, you know, who is being called on and who is not. And then you also have to prepare to call in uh, people who are more than likely unintentionally excluding people from conversation. And of course, in human rights law, invariably you get the, oh, we never intended to discriminate. That's all well and good, but the impact is the same, whether you intended or not. And you need to call in people. I'm not a big fan of calling out, you know, the naming, blaming and shaming. I think it's far better to call in and try and educate and encourage the, the person, the employer, the whomever to accept responsibility for their unintended impact. The university, and, maybe, if you're yeah. a student. Yeah. And you need to be very intentional because representation matters. If you talk the talk, but people pull back the curtain and they see no marginalized people working with you then what kind of ally are you if there's no representation or if you're a retailer, but you have no employees with disabilities working with you, or you have an ad campaign, oh, we're all about accessibility, but there's no accessibility information to be found. And, and the biggest thing too is always just ask, you know, before you help, just say, you know, am I able to help you? How can I help you? And respect boundaries because some people with disability don't want help and they don't appreciate, you know, you assuming that they need help. And it's a huge topic, John. I mean, this whole conversation kept in within the, the confines of an hour is, is pretty much impossible. You and I know each other. We could right. continue talking for hours on this. And because we're both passionate, we would love to do it but our poor uh, audience members have better things to do, I suspect. So uh, maybe gonna... not better, they have other things to do. <laughs> I don't know that they're better. Fair enough. And it's not my place to judge. <laughs> Listen, give me, give me two more minutes because yeah. we like to end these conversations with our change makers with what we call our speed round. Hmm. And I know it's hard for both of us to be speedy, but there are, are, are just a few brief questions that I want to ask you. Are you ready? Okay. Go for it. So when we, when we talk about change makers here at Hard House, we use the phrase leaders by example. What do you think makes a leader? Um, I think a leader is someone who sees what's missing and what thinks about what can be improved and rally people to move them forward toward that better vision. And a leader is somebody who's bold and takes a damn the torpedoes approach and move forward when necessary. But sometimes playing nice doesn't get you results. And so a leader will be empathic and, and connect with people authentically, but is prepared to make the hard choices and, and speak out and speak up. Can you give us an example of a leader that you admire or who has been particularly influential to your life? Yeah, I'm fortunate. I've got three that um, I, I really respect. The earliest one was uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. And you may think that's a fluffy answer. And oh, yeah, she wore pretty clothes. It wasn't about that. It was, if you really look at her legacy, she created a more accessible approach to the public. She championed uncomfortable causes like HIV and AIDS landmines, uh, visit the homeless shelters and leprosy wards, and she talked about mental health and bulimia. This was a young woman 
in her late 20s and 30s before at 36 she tragically died but royals were never talking about that it was always gloves on and and you just don't talk about those things so i think her legacy needs to be respected um the next what we heard a lot about during COVID was Dolly Parton. Again, you might think that's a fluffy answer. And oh, she's just some dizzy blonde who's a country singer. But Dolly funded research to create Moderna vaccine. She also created an imagination library in 1995, which is a book gifting program that mails free high quality books to children from birth to age five, independent of income. And it recently gifted its 150th million book in 2020, and it operates in five countries. I, I, think, I think that's incredible, humanitarian work. And then last is, is in our legal realm, uh, recently retired Supreme Court of Canada Justice, Rosalie Silverman Abella, is uh, she was the one that coined the term employment equity when she did research she's a child of holocaust survivors and she makes the law more humane and she really fuses her personal story and talks about how our personal story informs us and the quote that she uses is it's not just what you stand for it's what you stand up for and we can never forget how the world looks to those who are vulnerable that's powerful. Supreme Court of Canada Justice. So those three women kick an ass. <laughs> Lauren, I'm sure there are a lot of people on this conversation tonight that would add you to that same list. Uh, but let me ask you one last question because I know we are we are over time now. Yeah. If you could go back and talk to an 18 year old Lauren McDonald mm -hmm. about how to become a change maker what advice would you offer her? Ah, uh, don't care about what people think. If you've got a bold idea, charge forward and, and do it. Um, because people will always criticize you. Um, but if you have that inside you, move forward and don't let the naysayers drag you down. It's very important. Um, you're, all of us are here to create change, to be change makers, in my view, but many never get there because someone else is saying that's too big a dream. I would told that about here view and Michelle Obama. Why don't you why don't you lower your sight? Don't why Michelle Obama go for, you know, some community leader? And I said, no, dream big. What have you got to lose? And so that's the thing that I would definitely, I was, I was afraid to vocalize what my dreams were. But once I saw that they could happen, sky's the limit. Lauren, thank you so much on behalf of everyone at Heart House, on behalf of our entire audience, for being so generous with your, your time, with your, with your intellect, with your heart. We're just very grateful to you for all of it. For today's audience, um, I hope that you will stay connected uh, to Hard House. I hope that you will join us for the next exciting installment of our Changemaker series, which takes place on the 27th of May of this year with the wonderful uh, Winnie Mengesha, the groundbreaking stage and film director, and currently the artistic director of Soul Pepper Theater. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a wonderful evening and remember to be the change that you want to see in the world. Bye from Hard House. Thank you so much to Lauren McDonald for joining me in conversation. You can find Lauren on Facebook or follow her on Twitter at Lauren Mack. This Changemakers conversation was produced and supported by the team at Hard House. Jennifer Newcomb. Lena Yusin, Michelle Che, Megan Mueller, and Janine Raftopoulos. The podcast was edited by Janine Al Hadidi. Original music is by Recap. They can be found on SoundCloud. To learn more about the Changemaker series, please visit hardhouse.ca or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook.
Our handle is at Harthouse U of T. I'm John Monahan, and thank you for listening.